Hello, hello, and welcome to another virtual SQL Bit session. My name's Simon Whiteley. Hello. I'm going to talk to you about a thing called Value Driven BI, or to use the proper full title, how to think about delivering analytics projects in a way that focuses on the value to the business as opposed to the technology cost and the existing systems. But I think Value Driven BI kind of makes more sense. So we'll be talking data ops, we'll be talking DevOps, we'll be talking about lakes versus warehouses, and everything in between. So join me. Okay, so as I said, my name's Simon Wiley. I run a company called Advancing Analytics in the UK. We're a data analytics company. We do everything from data engineering, lakes, Spark, Databricks, all that kind of stuff, all the way through to data science and some really cool, interesting things. And we come across this problem a lot. A lot of what we do is building out analytics platforms to enable people to realize some kind of value. And time and time again, we have the same conversations of going, you aren't thinking about what the business wants. You're thinking about the technology. You're right, I must build a warehouse because that's what we do as warehouse developers. Not thinking, hey, you know, there's one in the business that, that needs something. We can save some money. We can make some money. We can do something faster than we used to do it. Whatever it happens to be, we've kind of lost sight of that a lot in terms of how we build systems. So what are we doing? We have these people, the all important business people. They are the people in the business, whoever they are. That could be the marketing team, it could be the C-suites, it could be the product development team deciding what product to build next. Whoever they are, they need data in some shape or form, and we've got that data. We have ones and zeros, lots and lots of interesting and yet hard to read data sets. And we're talking about how do we go from having these data sets, getting them all the way over to use by the business. And that's the bit that is challenging. Now, there's some kind of value in that data. We're saying this bit has a value, has a dollar amount that we can put on it saying that's going to earn us some money. It might be we can prioritize a better product to get ahead of the competition. Could be we could stop sending marketing to a certain segment of customers because there's no return on it. It could be we can get rid of a whole program of work because we know there's no longer value because we've got the data to back it up. Now, the problem is that translation that act of saying, I've got a lot of data over here, I want to get the data over here, costs money. And we're even about saying, how much is that actually going to make us? What's the value of that piece? We very rarely say, what's the cost of getting it there? So that ROI, we talk about ROI in terms of the cost of the platform, but we don't talk total cost of ownership that much. And we don't talk, well, if it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and the warehouse is more complicated and we have to go through a whole rigorous process to deploy it, and it takes longer and longer and longer to actually get that value to the end user. And longer is the key thing there, because what we don't tend to think about is an analytics team costs money. A, a developer sitting there building, whether it's building BI reports, whether it's building a warehouse or a lake or whatever it happens to be, that costs money the longer they spend on it. So all that time thinking and designing and modeling and cleaning and deploying and all these different actions that go into saying, I've got data over there, I want to get data to the user, the longer that takes, the more effort involved to get that data to the user, the more it costs us. And so the more we have to look at that comparison of going, well, this is the value it's delivering, this is what it cost, was it worth it? Now, this is the big problem in that we can't just give data to the end user. We can't just say, hey, like, here's all that mass of data that came from our logging system. Go nuts, because they're not data savvy. It is a technology problem. There's a barrier to entry before you can start working with these systems, which is why we have things like BI. The whole point of BI and dashboards and all that kind of stuff is to make data accessible. Now, there's been a fundamental shift in data over the past 10 years for essentially companies want to be data driven. They want a, a base level of data literacy across the company. But that's not saying every one in there is going to write some Python and delve into some JSON files to pull out the attributes they need, because that's just a huge amount of work and it's wasted effort for everyone to have to do that manually. So BI, absolutely 100%, should be a key part of the things we're talking about. But how do we work out the cost of making that BI and decide what things to bother putting into a star scheme and bother wrapping in a nice little data model compared to what things that we can do is this kind of scrappy way because it's one off and we don't tend to think too much about that so traditional way of thinking if i'm giving data to my end user it has to go into my data warehouse so my single source of the truth has everything that's where we do everything in the world and we go through these set stages so we get a load of data into a staging layer and that's just our data as it came in, no 
cleaning, no validation. It's just, this is the data to accurately represent the data that we received. We then pick it up and do some cleaning. We trim some strings, we format date strings, we get rid of any rows that were corrupted. We just get the data into a solid, valid, clean state. And then we pick it up and we do some shaping into a data model of sorts. Kimball is the de facto these days, but whether that data model is Kimball, star schemas, it's Inman, whether it's Data Vault, whether it's big, wide, flat reporting tables, don't really care. There's some kind of modeling done to shape it for business consumption that requires thinking about what you're trying to do. Who's going to use it? Why are they trying to understand it? What KPIs do I need in that data set? And that's the way to be thinking. So we've got data as we got it data that's been cleaned and validated, data that's been presented and transformed for business consumption. They're the, the traditional layers that we have. Now, there's a big bottleneck here in that getting data into the system is requires development and deployment. So if I've got a, let's pick up a case. Um, the business has come to us and said, we can now get clickstream data from our website. So there's now a massive, massive data set, which says any time a user visits, this is what they clicked on, they went on that page and then they left, they went on that page, went on the next page, they followed a recommendation, they bought something. That is super valuable information. And it's so big, really, really big, really unwieldy. We have tons and tons of extra attributes that we don't know what we want to do with. And so if we go to our warehouse developer and say, can we just land that in the warehouse and kind of get it into a star schema? I go, Sure, but we need to think about that stuff. We need to, at the very least, we need to design that staging table that can hold that data and deploy it to the production warehouse. Oh, the next release for the production warehouse is in two weeks' time, but we've just had the change uh, advisory board, so actually it's going to be in a month's time. And that window gets longer and longer. The time between someone saying, hey, can we do something cool with this data to take advantage of an opportunity, and us going, yes, here's the data, that window gets longer and longer, and that's time and therefore cost. So the value is impacted by how long it takes us to do this kind of stuff. So we're talking about this end to end. So we're saying, take my data that I've got kind of in my, um, my website in this case, put it through my warehouse, turn that crank, model the data, get it to the user. And then actually maybe there's some other systems because honestly it's a massive enterprise. We've got four warehouses. There's lots of different work. We need to decide which one we put it in, who owns it, the business owners, all of that kind of stuff. And you end up with this chain, this massive chain of work, which takes this take data from my original, get it all the way through and start getting value from that data. And that is, I need to analyze it, look at it, work out what's useful, work out what's not useful, decide how I want to model that data. Does that go into an existing star schema? How do I split it apart in dimensions? Do I need a user with the domain in the browser? Oh no, is browser a separate dimension here? Yeah, maybe it is. But I need to do a load of upfront work and thinking, and then I need to figure out what's back with it. Cleanse it, validate it, get it shaped, get it landed, so that I can do it properly for my star schema. I need to, I've got those rules in place. And then I can test it and make sure it hasn't broken my existing ETL, uh, and it hasn't kind of impacted the production warehouse. It goes through a whole load of system regression tests. And then I have my UAT phase where I can show my end users and go, is this what you wanted? Like that is a huge, huge amount of work to do before your users get a say. Now, I know lots of people are building Agile in, they're kind of getting people involved in user stories, and that's a key thing. But not everyone, I keep going for people still running this kind of stuff, waterfall, and I go, what? Because it is changing how we do things. The quicker we can get those business people's eyes on what we're planning to do, the better. But that's not the be all and end all. Just saying, yeah, we can, we can do some upfront validating of our design, that's not good enough. So, a few things that we do. Yes, we can do Agile to look at that analyze, model, clean, validate, shorten that time scale, get some early site, get some early validation in there. We can use DevOps. And again, DevOps is a big thing for data platforms, especially with everyone going to the cloud. So being able to say, how do we do testing? Can we automate some of the testing or can we at least set up all the testing to facilitate the faster testing of stuff? Can we spin up a UAT environment and get that done quickly to get their eyes on it? And deployment, prod deployments, the easier we can make it and the more often we do it, the less risk is perceived in a prod deployment, meaning we can do it more often, meaning the chance of us having that, oh no, we're not in the right cycle, you're going to have to wait a long time, gets less. The more often we deploy, the more comfortable we are deploying. Just makes sense. So there's different tools and approaches and philosophies that we can start to bring in, but them on their own, they're not gonna solve the world. Um, but they're still acting in the right direction. And what we're trying to do is take that chain, take that big list of stuff and squeeze it and say, 
actually, can we get this shorter? Still doing the same activity, which is going, can we just do it quicker? And that will get you so far. It won't get you to the end. But at least, shorter that path, the more work we've automated, the less work we're doing and repeating each time, the more likely we are to actually make more value. The ROI gets better because the actual value, the benefit we get of having delivered those analytics starts to outweigh the cost it took us to actually build the analytics. Just makes sense. Spend less doing things, the thing's worth more. Great. Okay, so that's with our existing technology stack. That's with our existing warehouse and saying, sure, we can be agile, sure, we can do DevOps, we can try and tweak and tailor the way that we work to improve that and work around limitations in the system. And why should we? That's where data lakes come in. Now, I'm a big, big fan of data lakes. We're using them all the time. Every project I do has a data lake in there somewhere. Now, it does come with challenges and it is a different way of working. But I want to tell why using it helps us focus on value. Firstly, there's no file type restrictions. So there's no, oh, clickstream. Oh, God, it's really big and it's JSON. Oh, that's not going to fit into a SQL server. Yeah, that's fine. Just put it in a lake. It's cool. Uh, not to say that everything's going to work perfectly. You know, if you've got thousands of tiny files, they don't perform that way in a lake, but it'll still work. So there's different patterns, there's different ways you have to work, and it is harder. You know, there are technologies that you have to kind of learn in order to work with this stuff. You have to become Spark Savvy or some other lake uh, equivalent processing technology. There's no structure restrictions, and that's a big one. So remember that staging table that we needed. We had to have deployed that to a production warehouse before we can start landing data into it. You don't need to do that with a lake. You can just say, well, actually, just put it in that folder. I don't need to know what the structure is. I don't, it, it doesn't even matter if the structure is invalid for the next data set I get. It can still land, and then I can divorce. I can look, go look at it later to work out what the problems were. I'm still capturing that data, and that is huge. Uh, again, you can land it without understanding why I'm landing it. I could put data in the lake and then go, I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but, you know, there's probably some value there. I'm going to do some modeling on it later. I'll work out how it fits into a start schema. But I don't have to have done that upfront thinking before I deploy it to my lake because there's no overhead of deploying it to my lake. There's a cost, sure. I'm not saying just throw all the data in the world in the lake and you'll be happy because you will incur costs. But the cost of storage in the lake is about one-fifth to a quarter of the cost of storage in a database, certainly in Azure. And so it's, it's a cheap place to put data. So you can say, like, put it there and we'll think about it later. But at least you've got the data. You've started trapping it. You've started, you can actually have people delving and munging and doing some data discovery. You've enabled the fast access of that data without having to have done the upfront thinking, the modeling, the value uh, checking. We can just start doing things very easily. Again, a little upfront design. It's the whole point. Uh, but it's not a silver bullet. It's not going to fix every problem in the world. It's not like slapping a lake in means you no longer need a warehouse or a data model and then everyone's living in a happy cloud of rainbows. It's a tool that can be used effectively to solve some of these problems. That's it. It's not magic. So comparing these two. So we've got the idea of warehouses, the traditional way of doing things. And we've got lakes. I'm kind of trying to compare between the two. So on the warehouse side of things, you know, they're stable and they're consistent. They're very auditable. I can have a very fixed data model with complex security. I can have row-level security in there. Uh, I can have like really good kind of relationships and a kind of a strongly defined data model. But it's slow. You know, SQL isn't a dynamic language. Sure, you can mash some strings together and run it as dynamic SQL, but that's that's not a dynamic language. That is a an abuse of language. Um, it's, it's not designed to be a one-size-fits-all writer code and run that for many, many different uses. It's designed to be a data model fixed query language. Now, on the leg side, massively automatable. If you're writing a Spark job, you can say, well, actually, just here's some generic transformations. Apply that set of transformations to any data set you see. You can just write generic scripts, which are incredibly reusable. And that is so powerful. Um, so they're really good for Agile. They're really good at the kind of flexibility of, I don't know what I'm going to deal with, but I'm going to build something generic because I don't need to know up front what I'm going to do with it. But yeah, data management and that kind of level of security and granularity is fairly immature. And it's not great at doing the real formal modeling. There's questions as to whether we need to do that anymore. Now, that's the traditional argument saying, OK, well, that's how it should work. The reason why we can do stuff like that with Lex so if I've got a Databricks job, I've got a Jupyter Notebook, so I've got a little bit of uh, Python using PySpark, I can write a job, and we do this all the time, 
which says, take this path in the lake, take this set of data, this set of files living in this directory. Now take this different structure I've got stored in some metadata. Now apply that structure to those files, kick out any rows that don't fit. And I can do that as a script. So that, that kind of the, the bad path, happy path kind of thing that you do a lot in terms of BI and ETL, chuck out any rows that don't fit this structure. Check out any rows that meet this validation criteria. That's like one of the most common things we do between that kind of staging and cleaning layers. We can write a single script that encapsulates those rules and then just use metadata to say, and now apply it to that table, apply it to that table, apply it to that table. So our clickstream data, our new data we're bringing in is we need to know where does it live in the lake? What structure do we want it to do? And then any cleaning rules, but that's metadata. So we start landing the data. I can start cleaning it by putting metadata in without deploying any code. And that's huge because DevOps is fantastic. It speeds up the process of deploying code. You cannot deploy code faster than not deploying code. <laughs> it's just config driven stuff. As long as it's well written, as long as it's easy to understand what it's doing, it's just so much faster to actually build. It enables agile development. So that's massive. So automated validation, huge thing that we do a lot of. So we go back to this whole chain and we've got that kind of big strip of stuff going on the top, that analyze, model, clean, validate, test, UAT, deploy, then start seeing the value. We can start to break parts of it up. Now, this is the architecture that you see a lot. This is the modern data warehouse, talking about having a lake layer, talking about having a relational layer. So you get the best of both worlds in terms of the different patterns. Now, this is something that's starting to be challenged. So this is what we've been building for the past couple of years. Um, and more and more, the lake, technology is maturing and the data warehouse technology is maturing. Essentially, warehouses are getting better at doing some of the lake bits. Lakes are getting far better at doing the warehouse bits. Certainly over on the Databricks side, they're pushing the idea of a data lake house. So that's saying, well, why don't we just take a lake and all the flexibility and coolness and scalability and all that kind of stuff, add in the transactional consistency, the auditing, the formal data management, the, all the kind of good stuff for where, all the arguments for using a warehouse, just take those and apply them into a lake. And that's what they're pushing for. There's a big push currently in the Databricks world to be doing, keep everything in the lake and you can do the best of both worlds via a single technology rather than having two different data stores. I'll be talking about that in another session. So come along to the Databricks Delta Lake and you, and I'll go into that in a lot more detail. But for now, back to the story. So. Cleaning and validate, I've put in my lake because that can be automated. That can be a single script. I can really, really squeeze down the amount of effort that takes to just a bit of metadata. The test UAT and deploy, we can do traditional DevOps in our databases. We can really squeeze that and make that efficient and managed. So actually what we're talking about is that analyze and model bit is the stuff that we can now think, well, how do we do that? Do we, need, we don't need to do it up front anymore because we've said we can land data in the lake without having to know its eventual end structure. We can do just land it, do some cleansing on it. And yeah, sure, we might change those cleansing rules and go back and refactor and iterate, but that's fine. That, that's easy to go back and change. So the analyzing and modeling, we can now do on that clean layer, that base layer inside our lake, where we have data that we can really quickly capture and clean. And we can do that as prototyping. So actually, before we thought about what that star schema looks like, before we said, this is the eventual data model, this is the, the effects and dimensions and all that kind of stuff, we can just access the lake and go, well, let's just run a query in there, pull it together, prototype a report and give it to the business. Before I've done my data modeling, before I've defined the schema and saw how it fits into existing models and all that kind of stuff, I can really, really quickly go, hey business, does this make sense? And they go, no, there's no value in that actually. Don't bother spending all the extra work. The work I would have done, modeling it and getting to a start scheme and all that kind of stuff, they've had a chance to play with production data in anger that tries to answer their problem and they can go, no, that doesn't work. And I've saved myself a ton of money. Or they can go, oh yeah, no, cool. That has value. And actually because of production data, because we're working in a kind of quick iterative way, we can quite quickly answer their question. And maybe they go, great, that's the answer I need. And that's what I need. Done. Don't, do any, don't bother making it to a formal model. We've answered the question. We've met the opportunity. Let's make a decision. Let's go away. Or they say, yeah, that's really good. Can I get that every day? And then we go, Shh. And then there's a separate piece of work to productionize it and put it into a model. So we can take that idea, that value realization idea, um, that is pure consultant speak. The amount of time it takes us from getting data and identifying potential data sets and getting it to the business and receiving value of some kind from it. That's the thing we're trying to squeeze. And if we say, you know what, in the new world, 
Cleaning and validation is automated. That kind of analyzing and modeling is prototyping. And then we get to work out how much value is in that data. And the idea of productionizing it, the kind of test UAT to develop of that, uh, the data model, the star schema, we can do that afterwards. We can remove that from our critical path to answering the question of how valuable is our data. And that's massive. So that thing that we started with, that huge, big time of how long our data takes, we squeezed right down and suddenly it's really important. And again, it's that ratio of value to cost. It's huge. And again, the cost of productionizing it might be huge. And that might be part of that decision going, you know, don't bother productionizing it because we've now got what we need. Or yes, we think, well, now that we've understood the data, now we've seen it, we can better understand the amount of investment versus return. Just makes sense. So that whole thing, that whole idea is data ops. A lot of stuff goes into it. And it's all about how you manage that production estate, how you manage innovation on production data versus development of formal frameworking. There's a lot that goes into it that, honestly, every time you hear data ops, when I first heard it, I winced and went, it's just DevOps for data. Yeah, I can, I can DevOps a database. Why, why does it need a special name? Uh, digging further into it and talking about how data is different than formal applications. How it's not just a develop some code, get it into production. It's all about actually the ability to analyze and prototype and work with production data in my production environment, not in a dev environment, to be able to quicker turn around value the, the difference between framework development and insight development is a whole different concept than you see in any other areas of data ops. Damn it. So it's the idea of taking agile, taking those tenants, thinking about things differently to shortcuts to how do I deliver value to the business? It's about a whole new set of tools and about making a sensible decision between traditional development, between code generation, so using something like BIML to generate SSIS because of all that kind of stuff, between using metadata-driven frameworks and understanding the impact that has on your development pipeline, and it's about working out value and making sure the baseline of everything you're doing is what value am I delivering to the business from doing that? And that's huge. So that, in a nutshell, is value-driven development, or data ops, or how to build a data lake house and why we build them these days. And hopefully that has given you a whole load of ideas and thoughts and challenges. Are you going, yeah, we have those problems. That's exactly what we do. Or are you thinking, you know what, we solved that and we find a different way and that's fine. I'm not saying there's one approach to doing this stuff. I'm just saying you should be thinking about this stuff and this should be the core tenant of how you design your workloads is how am I delivering value? So I am hanging around. I've probably been answering questions, hopefully. Uh, any more questions, don't forget to stop by our booth, I guess. Uh, Advanced Analytics does have a booth. We'll be around. There's some more sessions. Come and ask us some questions. Happy to talk data ops, lakes, warehousing, and all of that kind of stuff. Thanks for watching. We'll see you around. Cheers.